Just when I was making the last game theory video, a new war broke out between a nuclear country and an almost nuclear country. It's scary. Uh, but it's also a perfect time to learn about game theory, right? So today, uh, I'll focus on the prisoner's dilemma and a broader concept called the common pool problem. So uh, next time, I'll talk more about one of the major explanations for war, uh, the credible commitment problem. So stay tuned. In the coordination problem I talked about last time, uh, the players can achieve a win-win scenario as long as they have enough signals to predict the other people's strategy. So the key for those games is whether that information is available. But the prisoner's dilemma is a much bigger headache because even with sufficient information and even with perfect rationality, the players of the game will still end up in a lose-lose situation. Uh, I'll talk about how that simple phenomenon can totally mess up our lives and how we can address it. The model is very simple. Let's say uh, Tom and Jerry committed two crimes together. The cops can only prove one of the crimes and put them away for two years each. But uh, the cops tell Tom and Jerry separately that uh, if you testify about the other crime, but your buddy refuses to confess, I'll let you walk and put the other guy in jail for seven years. However, if you both confess, you no longer get that deal, but instead of seven years, you get a five for honesty. Uh, well, I use negative numbers here because, you know, the payoff from prison is negative. You know, the more prison you have, uh, the less satisfaction you have. Right? So you can tell what will happen, right? If you're Tom, here is your thinking process. Hmm, if Jerry confesses, I face two outcomes, five years or seven years. Obviously, five is better, so I confess. If Jerry doesn't confess, I also face two outcomes, zero and two. And zero is better. So I still should confess. So basically, regardless what Tom expects Jerry to do, his best strategy is always to confess. That's different from uh, the lover's game we talked about last time, right? The same is true for Jerry. So when all the players have a clear optimal strategy, that outcome is called an equilibrium. An equilibrium is a very powerful thing. Even though this outcome is much worse than this outcome, it would end up happening anyway because of the logic I just described. A lot of cops actually use this method to secure a confession. But you should know that this scenario is definitely not limited to prisoners. It happens all the time. Say if Tom and Jerry are two fishermen living next to a pound, they have to decide how much fish they want to catch every day. So here we can use the same table, except we change confess to overfish. So if they both refrain from overfishing, they will lose some short-term profit, but their life will be okay. But if they both overfish, the pound won't last very long, so they will both be worse off. Now the tricky part is that if Tom overfishes while Jerry doesn't, then Tom will enjoy a large profit, and they will even run Jerry out of business because he has way more fish. His average costs are lower because he doesn't worry about conservation. So very soon he will enjoy the pound all by himself, and then he can do whatever conservation he needs. So you can see the payoff structure is the same as the prisoner's dilemma. So eventually both guys will choose to overfish. In the real world, of course, we often have more than two fishermen per pound, which makes the problem even bigger because each fisherman's impact on sustainability is small. So no one has any incentive to refrain from overfishing. I remember meeting a guy who just started to learn fishing and he was like, whoa, these uh, fish cops actually come over and measure the size of my catch. Is that necessary? Oh man, it's definitely necessary, okay? Because of this, 
Without outside enforcement, no one will have any motivation not to catch small fish. That's an unfortunate nature of human rationality. Individual rationality doesn't always translate into collective rationality. So enforcement becomes a necessary evil. It's the same reason that some criminal organizations need enforcers against snitches. Right? They can't rely on their members' loyalty because of the prisoner's dilemma. They have to tell them in advance, or maybe through their dirty lawyers, if you testify, we're going to whack you. Okay. The threat of whacking fundamentally changed the payoff structure because even though confession gives you a shorter jail time, you may lose a limb. Right? These enforcers are like the criminal equivalent of fish officers. They change the payoff structure and get rid of the prisoner's dilemma. There are so many other examples. Uh, pollution, right? So before there was environmental regulations, the big industrial cities were basically bathing in smog. The factory owners were hurt by the smog too. But what can you do? You'd be out of business if you were the only factory that spent money on pollution control. So that's a prisoner's dilemma. So everyone pollutes. So you have to have outside enforcement to make sure every factory share the burden of smog control. Also, paying taxes for any non-excludable goods is really a prisoner's dilemma. Let's say national defense. If everyone can choose how much they pay for national defense, no one will pay a dime because if other people choose to pay, my money won't matter. If other people don't pay, my money still won't matter. So everyone ends up not paying. That's why in every single country, taxes are enforced. You go to jail for not paying because the jail time changes the payoff structure and solves the uh, prisoner's dilemma. Also, the nuclear arm races between countries. That's a big prisoner's dilemma that people still haven't found a solution for. Say, if every country stopped making nukes, that's great. But each side has an incentive to cheat, just like the prisoners. If other countries are making nukes, I can't afford not having it. And if other countries aren't, it'll be great to be the only country who has it. So either way, I'm making it. That's partly what you see between Israel and Iran. Uh, one solution would be international regulations and sanctions, but they don't always work, especially on countries that have abundant resources. Of course, armed races don't always end up in war. So how do we explain war? War is bad for both sides and still keeps happening. So it's kind of similar to the prisoner's dilemma, but it's more complicated. Normally, the two sides have a much stronger incentive to maintain peace compared to the prisoner and fishing situations because you know, even winning a war can be more costly than not having a war in the first place. In other words, the payoff structure is a little different. This number may be larger than this number, so peace is still quite possible, but not guaranteed. Next time, I'll introduce something called a mixed strategy equilibrium, meaning that the outcome of the game is uncertain. Uh, it'll involve a little bit of uh, algebra, but not too much. So uh, stay tuned.